Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the One Sacred Pause podcast. I'm your host, Jessica, and I'm so excited. We are launching season five. Uh, It's been almost three years, which is so crazy. And today is really exciting because I have the first repeat guest in the history of the podcast on. Um, Kate Murphy is here to talk with us about all kinds of amazing things business life yoga related. And she was also a guest on the podcast way back when, and like maybe the second or third, fourth episode of season one. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. I'm so excited to be back. I can't believe it's been going on this many years. Congratulations. It's Thank amazing. you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It is crazy. It's like, wow. I feel like we skipped a few years in there, but I guess, I guess we were just busy <laughs> living our life feels something like that and so much has changed too it's like new career babies like new businesses there's so much has happened since we last met in this forum yeah I know it's so crazy and it's awesome to see and you know I think that's one of the things that's so important about having women in your community who are kind of in the same same space as you in terms of either the businesses that they're involved in or the industry that they're involved in and Um, I know that you're really heavily involved in mentorship, both for other people and for yourself and and part of these groups that are involved in women mentorship. And it's cool because it's, you can see the progression in one another and like, see like, oh yeah, I remember when you were doing this and oh yeah, wow, that was, that was amazing. And, you know, vice versa um, for you and I, and, and, you know, we've taught at the same yoga studios and so it's cool when you get to see, see that growth occur. I love that. Yeah. And it's so true. Not just like the personal growth, but also the life growth and how like we've transformed over the years, like you've become a mother in this last year and how that can transform how you choose to work, the way you work, uh, what you do. I know a lot of women when they become mothers change career paths because they have something new that sparks um, love in a new way. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And it's We can definitely dive more into that as we get going, um, because I I have a feeling this might weave into our conversation organically anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but the, you know, I really wanted to talk to you again. You know, we were joking before recording that you and I haven't actually like seen each other physically in almost a year. And one of the last times we met, we had coffee in Oslo and we were kind of talking about, you know, a couple of projects that were sort of on the periphery for both of us and kind of next steps for both of us in a very um, uh, abstract way a little bit. You know, one of the things that was really, that I'm still excited about and I still am hoping there will be space for sometime in the future is, you know, you and I were considering collaborating on creating some sort of a a women's wellness forum in Norway and how we could, um, you know, have host these evenings and have speakers come and talk about things like that. But then also you were percolating this idea that you've been thinking about for a really long time and you now are getting ready to launch your brand new business. And will you kind of tell us what what you're up to and what's about to happen? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, I mean, what I'm launching now, I've called the feminine code and the feminine code is something that's been brewing inside of me for years. Um, My background has been in very formal business, meaning very masculine dominated, as well as myself being very masculine in the way that I operate. And I burnt out, (laughs) surprise. And over time, um, I started to understand there was a missing component in business and that was the feminine and the values of the feminine, the uh, archetypal energies of the feminine and So this kind of came about, the feminine code came about because I realized this needed to kind of come back into our lives in a bigger way, especially around business. So the feminine code is essentially a methodology that I use to help women grow and start businesses in a way that also honors and brings in the feminine. What that means, (laughs) a lot of different things, whether it's related to 
the nature and the wisdom of nature, the cycles of the seasons, the moon phases, uh, the menstrual cycle. It's about weaving all of this together in order to bring about a business that actually supports you rather than drains you. Mm. That's awesome. And so you're launching really soon. And so what's the format for this training? Is it, is it on demand or is it a closed group or how does it work? It's an eight week closed group because, because I'm working with the phases of the moon and the cycles, every cohort will be closed over the period of eight weeks. So we actually move through two entire moon cycles together and we use the cycles to actually facilitate the training. And so it's, you don't have to finish it within the eight weeks because you'll have access to the program for a year after registering, but to follow the program at the cadence at which it's given can really help um, elevate your experience in, in the training and then how you execute it in your business after. Mm. And is it a set number of participants or is it just however many people choose to, to sign up at that particular time. I want to keep the groups relatively small because I do do some one-on-one -on -one work in it as well. So there is a limitation of how many I take in, but uh, the group will usually be under 25 mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. And is it targeted towards women only or can men come? At the moment, it's anyone who identifies as a woman mm -hmm. uh, because I'm working with the menstruation and with um, the moon phases from a ceremonial standpoint, I'm trying to keep the container very safe for women. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that men cannot benefit from this work and from this methodology. It's that I feel at this phase of the feminine code where it's just birthing, just sprouting, that there's an important it's important to ensure that women have a safe container to become more comfortable with their feminine. Because I see a big problem is that a lot of women are actually afraid of the feminine. And we, many in business, will move towards this masculine energy because it's what we have been told makes us successful, makes us rise up in the companies, makes our businesses um, more financially viable. And what I want to shift is that perspective for women first, because men can't look at the feminine embodied by a woman if she's just reflecting back the masculine so if more women step into the strength of the feminine then we can hold space for that to also be safe for men to accept and maybe even embrace more feminine values and how businesses are run in general i mean the reality is is that two of the parts will make a greater whole when we bring together the masculine the feminine the yin the yang or rather the yang and the yin in that case, we are bringing and finding unity. We are, we are creating something greater than two separate parts. And that's kind of why I've started with women now, but over time I can see this broadening out into a methodology that anyone can use in any business. Hmm. That's awesome. And I, I absolutely, think there's a, a big need for what you're putting out there and birthing into our community because you know I came from a law background and I remember one of my first jobs at this law firm and um, you are you know you're given your set number of like vacation days or whatever in the U.S. and so my first year at this law firm I had a week of vacation that I could use I think maybe I was given like a week and a half I don't remember the exact number but anyways I was too afraid to take my vacation time because in a lot of these industries, these masculine driven in industries, um, and I don't mean masculine in, in terms of, of a male biological body. I mean, masculine in terms of the energy of how it's like more, faster, better productivity. What's the bottom line? What are your billable hours? All of this stuff. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, what happens if I leave for a week? <laughs> and it was like, oh I was in I, I, yeah, I mean, I knew I wouldn't get fired, but like, there's still this unspoken, like, oh, you're taking your vacation time. And I know in the US, this is a huge problem. I mean, in Norway, you know, this is not at all as big of a problem um, compared to the US. I laugh when I just see the differences because in Norway, you know, I have to be really careful about when I schedule my teacher trainings, because there's so many holidays here. And if I schedule it on, on kind of a 
less important, we'll say holiday, I'll get emails of like, did you know that this is, this is the third workers, workers day of the year? And, and I'm like, no, I didn't know. Ah. <laughs> Whereas in, in the US, you're given your 12 days of vacation a year. And the majority of vacation time across the country goes unused because it's, it's almost a sign of weakness if you take a rest and you take a break. And it's, of course, then leads to all of these problems, both physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. And um, so shifting the dynamic and shifting the conversation to like, wait a minute, why are we seeing the energy of the feminine resting, contemplating, considering as a negative when it actually can be a huge benefit if you are more strategic in how you spend your energy. Absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail right on the head of like, how do we bring in these elements of this reflection and almost re re receiving instead of always pushing? And if we're able to do that in business, imagine the ideas that come about, the solutions that come about, how things can be like greater than the piece again, because now we're all of a sudden thinking about the whole picture from a collaborative standpoint, where we think about solutions that wouldn't come in a very quick, short, you know, 20 minutes, I need to make a call now. Mm -hmm. Like I, when you're talking about this whole um, feeling like you have to do this work, when I moved from Canada to Norway, and was starting up Play Magnus, I would be at the office till 10, 11 o'clock p.m. on a Friday night, working on Saturday morning, working insane hours, because that is what I felt was expected of what it ha what happens when you're running a startup. But everyone else in the building was gone at 4.30 p.m. And that's also part of what happened with my awakening is I realized there were more feminine values in Norway being valued around that work-life balance than I had experienced in North America. So definitely this, uh, this aspect of rising up the feminine value in how we work, not even our own businesses, but how we choose to work in other businesses if we're employed by big corporations, that they are, there is a possibility for us to set our own boundaries. Mm. And you know, there, there has to be uh, someone that takes a step and is brave enough to say, actually, I'm going to take those vacation days. Actually, I'm going to take early off on this day because I just need a break or want to spend time with my family. Um, yeah. I, well, I think that's the main concept there is boundaries. How do we first identify what our boundary is? Because I think that's the big problem is, you know, we just in conversation and anecdotally, you, you talk to your friend, you talk to your brother, you talk to whoever, and you're like, how are you doing? How's it going? And they're like, oh yeah, pretty good. I'm really busy. <laughs> the standard response, I'm really busy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, if you could identify what would help you feel less anxiety, less stress, more grounded in your daily life. When we ask that question, most people are like, oh, I don't know, take a nap. Like there's no concrete definition of like, well, what would that boundary look like? And then once we have identified it, then we can start to work towards implementing plans and to, to help us contain those boundaries. And I know for myself, that's absolutely something I work with on a pretty consistent basis is like, you know, when I start to feel that masculine energy rising and my inbox is filling up and I'm like getting really like, oh my God, wait a minute, but my, I want to spend time with my kid or, oh wait, I need to go take care of some life matters right now. Holding that boundary in place without it seeping into the energy of the other areas of my life. Mm. And, and I, that's a struggle for me. I, I work on that, but I found that if I can start to really name my emotion around the stuff, where I'm feeling the energy around the stuff, then it becomes a little easier to, to hold a boundary with that. It's like, okay, is this urgent? Like, do I really have to deal with this work related matter? Like right now? Cause mm -hmm. sometimes there are things that are like very urgent, but the majority of the time you can punt it a little bit. And mm -hmm. so I think, is that anything that you address in your um, feminine code course is like how to identify your boundaries? We don't talk specifically about identifying boundaries, but we do talk about boundaries and where do we need to say no and shut down. And I work a lot with the cycles about when that might be most beneficial for you to really be harder on your boundaries. That being 
because I'm working with the menstrual cycle, I'm looking a lot at the luteal phase and the new moon phase where you're bleeding as areas where you need to hold a stronger boundary and protect your energy a little more, especially as it comes to being asked to do too much in your business or if you feel like that you're doing too much in your own business. Like this is the time where you should be scheduling or can be scheduling your, your life differently. Like looking at how do I allow space for this phase? How do I use this, this phase to be reflecting and ideating and creating, but not executing, not presenting, not being out in the world during those days. And, and so in that respect, yes, we, we do look at boundaries and when they, they should be coming about. I think you and I also have come from very corporate backgrounds as well. So learning to set those boundaries when you're in a corporate environment can be a bit more difficult <laughs> because you're answering to somebody else. So then it becomes about how can you take a bit more ownership over your time, your schedule, um, your deliverables as best you can. And yeah, there's going to be stuff that pops up that's urgent that you need to deal with. At the same time, how can you help support yourself uh, in that? And how can you say, when can you say no? Because oftentimes we say yes when we don't really need to, when it's not really important and when it's actually somebody else's job. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. That's, there's so many layers to that, you know, things that we've learned through society, things that we've learned from our family. And as women in particular, I think it's natural for us to maybe give more than our male counterparts. And um, (laughs) becoming a new mom has really shown me that, how the mental load of being a woman, a woman in business, a woman who is creating a family, uh, all of a sudden there's a lot of extra expectations and these are very subtle, very nuanced expectations. And to, to navigate that for me is now a new challenge. And it wasn't one that I was expecting um, at all because of course I've never been a mom before. And yeah, I think there's just a lot of, of things that individually every woman who is a business individual has to uh, kind of sift through for themselves and having your course and the structure of your course, I'm sure is going to be immensely helpful for a lot of women. Um, Do you, is your course, the people who you expect to sign up or have registered already, are they people who are, who are in the beginning phases of starting their business or are they people who've already established a business and are now just looking for some refinement and guidance as they expand and grow? Yeah, it's both. Uh, There's some that are coming in that have an idea or have an inkling that they want to do something in a certain space and they want to build it up through the course. And there's some that already have businesses established and they're wanting to reframe how they're doing that. Mm -hmm. So they're almost like looking again at packaging, looking again at pricing, looking again at what are the products that should be here? Are there new products that need to be birthed or are there products that need to die? Mm -hmm. Um, Looking at how to structure time, how to go through a process that facilitates holding themselves accountable, but also comfortable. Um, so it's, a, it's both. And I think that's what makes it really interesting that because I'm teaching frameworks that, you know, you might've launched your business and already priced it, but is that truly the optimal pricing for what you're looking to create for yourself in terms of a financial return? And yeah, we talk about the financial return, but also the energetics of the return. Mm-hmm. Like, are you really getting back that nourishment for what you're putting out into the world and finding the reciprocity of giving and receiving? So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, well, and that's such a, I mean, I think that is the question. <laughs> the, the energetic return of your offering, the energetic return of, of what you are trying to create through your business offerings. And that's something that I, I've heard a lot of people struggle with. And I occasionally I'll struggle with it too, but you know, it's hard because when you are a startup or you're a small company and you work for yourself and you're like, okay, if I don't work, I don't get paid. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a very clear connection there. And so having that ability to be like, hmm, okay, where, 
am I, am I putting all this effort in? I'm creating, like, I'm going to use an example and I don't know what your experience has been with this. I'd love to hear. Um, there was a craze a few years ago and it's, it seems to be trickling out a little bit, but I don't know. Ebooks where mm-hmm. everybody was making an ebook and everybody was either trying to sell it or they were giving it away for free as their, their hook on their website. Um, and I had thought about it. I was like, okay, great. An ebook seems like a great idea. And I had, I was going to hire my graphic designer who I'd worked with for a long time. I was like, okay, I want to put together this really beautiful ebook. And, and then I thought about it and I was like, God, that's going to be a ton of energy, a ton of money to have a graphic designer design every single page of an ebook. Mm-hmm. And, and then I was like, man, but financially, I don't think I'm going to get as much back as I'm putting in. So I scrapped that idea, mm-hmm. but, but there are other ideas where it's like, okay, you it, it does seem to be reciprocal. And then there's also things where you see the benefit or play what I call it, you know, sports analogy. And I'm not a sports person, so it's funny, but the long game, like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a firm believer in trying to play the long game and have the vision for the success of your business. And so that does require perhaps a little bit more sweat equity up front. Mm-hmm. And you, you're hoping for a payoff later down the line, but that's a fine line between burning, burning your candle at both ends of like, okay, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And, and then not seeing any return, not seeing any promise of a return or any acceleration of, of your business revenue. And I hear that a lot from some studio owner, yoga studio owners, not in Norway necessarily, but in the U S where they're, the studio owners are there from six in the morning until 10 at night every day. And they're missing their kids ballet recital and they're, you know, changing the toilet paper and they're doing all this stuff. And they're like, and I'm barely making any money. I can't even pay my rent at the studio pre COVID. And, and I would look at that and I was like, man, I couldn't do that at all. And, you know, there's a struggle there. And so it's like, is the struggle a payoff or is the struggle a struggle just to be a struggle? Right. Yeah this is potent what you're discussing now and and this might be a bit controversial what i'm about to say but a lot of times i think people go into businesses create businesses without it being without it being what they're really here to do mm-hmm. and when you're not when you're creating a business and it's not in line with what you're here to do it's not truly authentic to what you're here to do and linked into your passion and you're creating it it's going to hit walls Mm. because you're being reflected back the blockages and the boundaries that are within yourself and so it's not to say that a yoga um, teacher that opens up her own studio isn't doing what's in line with her dharma but there's probably things that are coming up again she's coming up against that are already blockages within her own self Meaning, if you're coming in and you're barely making any money and you keep hitting walls, where is that money block in yourself? And then we start to have to look at the individual. And I'm talking specifically about entrepreneurs now, because you need to start looking at where am I blocked? Where is my energy not moving? Because that is going to be expressed in your business very explicitly. Mm -hmm. You won't avoid it. It will be even bigger because now all of a sudden, your employee's payment depends on it. Your rent depends on it. Um, And so ensuring that when you are moving into a new business, that you are really, really doing what you are feeling called to and not just doing something because that girl over there is doing it and she looks pretty successful and I can do that too. And and, because that's just going to end up in a very vicious spiral. (laughs) Oh, that's so true. And and I think that also kind of comes back to the idea of, of the masculine energy of our entire society where, you know, we're kind of fed this line, right? You go to school, you go to university, you get out, you get a good job, you start climbing the ladder. And it's sort of this one size fits all prescription for how it's supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, we know that's not going to be happy and successful and easeful for many people. Um, because we're also individual in our, in our talents and in our desires for how we want to live our life. And um, I almost think it's, there's some safety in doing what looks like it's easy to do, if that makes sense. Um, You know, I'll use the example, like 
you know, I went into the law because, well, I mean, I did have an interest in it. Um, but it's also like people, you know what that is. Like my parents knew what that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you, you quit your corporate job, which, you know, you've recently done and you step off into this like wellness entrepreneurship space. And it's like, oh, you're going to be a yoga teacher. Huh? Okay. <laughs> and I know it's, it's fun. It's been my dad is super supportive and I just love him to bits and he's, you know, been a successful businessman. And, (laughs) you know, when I first started the Atman yoga school, it was like, kind of like, he was like, okay, I'm not going to say anything. I'll just sort of like watch, even though I've been a yoga teacher for a long time and, you know, was, was able to support myself and whatever, pay my bills through teaching yoga. And then like a couple years into it, he just, you know, slowly started being like, wow, I'm really, impressed with what you've managed to do. And I'm so proud of what you've managed to do. And, and so at the back of my mind, there's almost like this little, like, I proved you wrong, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, but that's also, you know, what a lot of people don't see is the hard work behind the scenes when you start a business and it's, yeah, it's just kind of what we were talking about is like this fine line between how do you ebb and flow? I think for me, that's a really important thing, ebbing and flowing between the masculine and the feminine. When do you need to push and when do you need to rest? When do you need to go forward? When do you need to take a step back? And there's no, there's no like guidebook for that. Like each person has to feel that out for themselves a little bit. And within the nuances of how their business runs and, you know, I have a, I have a seasonal business. Um, my trainings run seasonally. And so I have to kind of flow with that a little bit too. And yeah, it's just an interesting standpoint of like, okay, what happens when you step off the ledge of the known? And now you're kind of in this space where maybe people don't know what it is you're doing. Your family doesn't know what it is you're doing. And you're like, no, 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 no. (laughs) I promise it's going to be awesome. You're like, well, okay. I don't know. (laughs) It is the truth, like exactly what you went through with going into law. I mean, I had a very similar experience when I went to go do my MBA. I was in this headspace of, I need to do my MBA if I'm going to be successful in business. Well, let me tell you, when I started at Play Magnus, I didn't need my MBA. (laughs) I needed like a whole expansive understanding of what I was here to create. That's what I needed. And dedication, because you're right, starting up a business, hard work. It's hard work. And that's why it needs to be aligned with what you're here to do. Because if it's not, you will burn out. Mm. Um, Well, go ahead. No, you, please. Well, I just was going to touch on what you, the word that you, you've used Dharma and being in alignment with your purpose and what your, your spiritual soul is saying you're here to do. And, you know, this dips into a little bit more of kind of the woo woo philosophy, I guess, but you can see dharma in in every industry you can see dharma being lived and and also not being lived everywhere around us and i think that's really cool when you're like when people find whatever it is that they are meant to do that lights them up and you know i did this this actual podcast episode with um Tyrell Refsum about dharma and and how and we were saying that dharma is when you can't not do something because you're, you're so magnetized towards your vision and towards your dream and towards your goal that even when it's hard, you still find a way to get out of bed and get up and do what you have to do. Mm. And I'm, I think that's kind of one of the things that you're going to help a lot of people with is like, okay, well, what's the difference between being so motivated because you're so in line with what you're meant to be doing that you're like, okay, I have to do this versus that resistance that you were talking about. Like you, you mentally think you should be doing something. You mentally think it's the right thing, but then maybe your heart isn't feeling what your head is saying. Mm -hmm. And so finding that connection between your heart and your head and making sure they're on the same track um, is, is the key piece to knowing, is it your Dharma or is it not? And if there's some like constriction or, or, confinement around like, oh, maybe I'll open a yoga studio because that girl did it. Or I'm going to become a wellness influencer because that girl did it. It's like, well, if it's not a hundred percent, you know, and and this cuts now into intuition too, because if you're ignoring those itty 
bitty teeny little messages coming through at the back of your mind or in the gut of your stomach or, you know, around your heart space. Maybe you'll be successful in the short term, but you're never going to be successful in the long run. Yeah, it, it will become too much. Yeah. yeah. Well, and either you get burnt out, like you talked about, or something is just never going to fall into place. There's always going to be struggle. And that's, you know, a question I would love to hear from you about is like, how did you make that decision to leave your corporate job and step off the ledge mm -hmm. <laughs> into doing this full time? <laughs> I mean, it's a scary thing to leave a full time, well paying, exciting job. I mean, I love my work at Play Magnus. I did. And I was doing what I was supposed to be doing at the time. But over the last, I would say, year and a half to two years of my time there, I knew I was exiting. I knew my time was coming and that I was here to do something else that was even more in alignment with what, why I'm here. And coming out of the company, you know, it was bittersweet. I had a hundred thousand pound weight lifted off my shoulders when I exited mm -hmm. because I wasn't, I was no longer in the place I was supposed to be. I wasn't elevating anymore. And I took all of that experience and all the learnings I had from those years there and from I dance previous to that. And also my blog, like all these things I was doing. And I realized that in the last few years of my time at Play Magnus, I had actually changed how I was working. I thought, why can't I just share this? like share with other women how they can do what I did. I mean, lifting that company to a point at which it was taken over to a public uh, IPO. I mean, why can't more women do this? And, and in a way that supports our wellness, our health, our spiritual health, our mental health, our physical health. Um, because I tell you the first few years when I was in that role, I was not supporting any of that. Mm -hmm. And I did hit a wall during my time there. And I knew that I could make a change that would actually benefit not only the company, but me personally. So yeah, leaving your corporate job, it's, it's a good idea when you know what you're stepping into next, uh, if you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> you don't want to step out unless you're being like totally burnt out and you just can't do it anymore. But stepping out before you have an idea of what you're going to go after can be extremely stressful and actually detract from what you're here to do. Because now all of a sudden there's the financial piece at play where you can't pay your rent and um, maybe you're going to have to struggle with that and take on some other type of work that is even more draining and paying less. And so I really believe in having a game plan and like there is a masculine aspect of that like the energy of like having a plan in place for what's the next steps and what you're going forward and moving towards I think is important and then I took the last year and a half of my time at Play Magnus working with the feminine code it was already in in process like I was taking my weekends and coming up with content and you know, actually starting to build out what I was going to step into um, before I left. And I think that's a, something that really helped me in making that exit. Mm. That's such an important point. It's, um, I've shared this story before on my podcast, um, probably a few times, because it really stuck with me. I was doing a teacher training many years ago, and I was a student in it. And there was a girl in the training and she was halfway through her senior year of college and she we graduated from this teacher training and she still had a semester left and she was like she's like you know what I'm dropping out of college and I'm just going to teach yoga and I was like hmm okay have you thought have you thought this through and she's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like I need to teach yoga. I'm, I'm just so called to teach yoga. And I was like, yeah, but you're only a semester away. Like, well, why don't you just finish college, get your degree and then teach yoga. And then you at least have your degree. And, and she was just like, no, I'm not. That's what my parents want me to do. I'm not going to do that. And I, I don't know whatever happened with that girl. Like we didn't stay in touch, but it just, it was so indicative of when we get fired up and something new is in our life. And we're like, oh my God, I love yoga. I love wellness. I love whatever. 
and we don't think it through and we step off the ledge and we're unprepared and there is no plan in place and there's no safety net to catch us. And, you know, I, I, I planned for a long time as well before I quit my corporate job and moved into teaching yoga full time. Like it wasn't, a, it wasn't a decision I made overnight. Like I, I actually spent about a year teaching yoga full time and working my corporate job full time. <laughs> so I had no life. But it was so that I had that foundation of like, well, can I do this? Can I support myself? And, and then once I could, I was like, all right, here we go. And that was so scary handing in my resignation letter. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think there is something to be said for, all right, think it through. And then just put all your eggs in, in this basket. But until then, like, that, that's, it's almost, well, I'll say it is. It's really reckless can be definitely and like when you're exiting and going into something new it's like you also want to have time to test mm -hmm. testing is important it's like when i was putting out new apps or digital products in play magnus we would test things for three months before we put that new feature out or that new product out you know we would have a user group and we would work through and that was to test if there was going to be success and if there wasn't there was a reframing there was a coming back reassessing and going back out again and i think doing that before you jump out and leave can also be done where you like you did you were teaching you were seeing like what kind of income can i bring in through this what other business uh, chain or revenue streams can i develop and create for myself and like starting to get more clear on how it's all going to come together and build the network in that new area if you're changing um, industries like how do i get a some, uh, a group that can support me in this journey, because that's also really important. It's so important. Can you speak to that for just a second? Like what, what's your experience been moving from a community of very masculine minded individuals within the, the business structure that you came from, and then now shifting into this more feminine space and, and where, you, where you're landing now? Mm. Yeah, it you mean around the network building? Yeah. Specifically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. During my corporate career, I'd always been on another journey and that was my spiritual journey and yoga was a big part of that and so was what is called the priestess path, which is a path that you are very connected to the divine feminine it's there's many women that are practicing this way of life of reconnecting to nature and coming back home to um, trusting intuition and moving through in this very feminine way and i was doing this at the same time i was leading play magnus and so on the side i was hosting moon ceremonies and circles women's circles and teaching yoga and all of these things i was doing because they were my passion not because i was trying to earn money from them and i understood over time that in that community there was many women that had great ideas but didn't have the same business background i had and so i started to build this community because of my passion and connection to the this work and over time I would say like over some years, I created a, a really beautiful foundation for which I could step into and actually create my career there. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't, it also doesn't mean you have to take years to develop the network there. Like if you want to work on a shorter time frame, go for it. I was really happy doing what I was doing in my business. So it, for me, it never felt like a pressure. The last year and a half felt like I'm ready. I'm ready to make the move. And it, and it took some time until I did it. And now that I've made that move, I can see myself still having this business network over here. And that's actually very helpful for the work I'm doing over here <laughs> in the spiritual space. So yeah, I think you can build out your network, combine your network, and at the same time, uh, take uh, benefits and, and uh, learnings from each over to the other. Hmm. So I know this, you might not have an answer to this question because so many things are uncertain right now in, in the world and the times that we live in. Um, you're currently in Vancouver and hoping to come back to Oslo. What's kind of your, your next step or the next phase 
for you, for Kate Murphy? Are you still running your blog? Is that kind of maybe going to the wayside? Is your all 100% of your focus on the feminine code? Are you going to be teaching yoga and doing women's circles when you come back to Norway? Or what's what are you envisioning for yourself and your new career? Yeah, thank you. There's a lot in flux right now. New things have come into my life just in the last month that are like shifting up what my game plan was two months ago. That being said, definitely we'll be back to Oslo within the next month, I hope. <laughs> um, and back to teaching when the studios open again in March, I hope. <laughs> Uh, but I will still maintain a very light teaching schedule as I always have, because that for me, um, I, I do it out of love. And that's, you know, it's never been um, what I wanted to do as my career. I'm going to take feminine code as my career and yoga is a part of that. So it's not 100% yoga, but there is there are elements of it. And I'll again be hosting circles. I'm doing them online now, given our current situation. And that works out okay since I'm on the other side of the ocean. <laughs> um, but yeah, over the next year and maybe two, I'll be building out Feminine Code and considering writing a book on the methodology, um, where I'm going to live. I don't know. I'm, I'm uh, still going through the citizenship application in Norway and um, want to have some roots there. And I also have roots here in Vancouver where my family is and so we'll see. It, it, this year is it going to be a shifter. I feel it. Mm. Yeah, things are going to shift. When so this kind of circling back to a little bit what we were talking about at the beginning, but when in your personal life, when you feel things shifting or you feel like there's a, a period of transition, what are some of your go-to self-care routines, or what do you like to do to kind of help yourself find clarity in a moment where maybe you don't feel like you have a lot of clarity. Yeah. I think some of it comes back to finding peace in the unknown and it's not easy to do. I have moments where I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like, <laughs> what am I going to do? But oftentimes it helps to talk about it, you know, with someone that you trust or feel safe with. Um, I love taking baths. I take a lot of baths. And I meditate in my baths and I, Oh, you're killing me. Yeah. That sounds amazing. And of course, you know, in Norway, finding a bathtub is not as easy. Ooh, not easy. However, there are a few of my friends that have those ba the ba the I don't know, ba the baleen or something. It's like a bath that you fill up with your shower head. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Like the plastic ones. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen a few of them in apartments around Oslo. Um, but yeah, I think like my meditation practice has been my my core for years like for the last 15 years my meditation practice has been what helps me most um i pray i sing i dance you know i i do things to help get out of head and into heart and into body um it, it's all just a practice of coming back home and you know it's normal to fall out of center that is life like we're always falling out of center being pulled this way being pulled that way how do we come back home and so those are the the ways that like, off the top of my head sometimes i'll give myself a ceremony you know i'll sit at my altar and i will uh, create for myself some type of ritual that i need for that issue i'm facing or question i'm facing um, and that can be anything from like lighting a candle and watching the candle doing chatak and and just focusing on my intention of what I want an answer for or clarity on um, so yeah those are some of the ways hmm. what is your biggest piece of advice to somebody who wants to start a business or refine their business in a more feminine way mm. If you are in your bleeding years and bleeding, you have a uterus still, and it is um, in that phase and you're not on a pill that's uh, changing that, I think the first thing is to really get comfy with your cycle, really comfortable, like day by day, tracking it, charting it, um, understanding how the, the nuance changes that happen throughout the month and doing that over a series of several months 
so that you really become really good friends with her. Hmm. And when we are able to do that, we can start to refine how we're creating, working and building. If you're not bleeding and if you don't have a, a physical uterus or you are on the pill, working with the moon cycles can give the same. So you track yourself throughout the month and perhaps instead of tracking with the bleed, you're tracking with the full and new moon um, and looking at how does your energy change? How do you change? Um, is there a certain time of the month, particularly that things get a little bit more down low? Um, you get more internal and are there other times of the month you're more expansive and expressive and you know you wanna be social and out with people and getting really clear on you and your needs. I think that's like, the key of where we start, like a foundational beginning. Mm, I absolutely love that. I think that's amazing advice. And I'm so in awe and impressed when I see women like you and, and there's other women kind of in the, the Oslo circle and the Norwegian circle, and of course, internationally, who are really talking about the ideas of tracking the menstrual cycle and using that as not, I don't, I haven't seen anybody else using that as a, as a guide for business practices, but using that just as a way to become more familiar with who you are on a deeper level and, and the information that our cycle gives us. And, you know, I know for myself, I talked a little bit about this in my conscious conception episode and, you know, we're taught, at least I was taught and, and all my friends were kind of taught, um, through society, not necessarily directly from my, my own mother, but just from society, like you, you get your period when you're 12 or 13 or whatever. And for the first time, and then you're like, oh, from there on, what a drag. It's that time of the month. I'm in so much pain and I have my cramps and I'm bloating. And, and that's the messaging that we hear. And then now there's this whole revolution of women who are taking the message of like, whoa, 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 time out. That's not actually accurate or correct. And listening to the wisdom of your body through the information that your cycle provides you with is so awesome, like in mm -hmm. the truest sense of the word. And when I started really paying attention to my cycle and the information that I got from that, I was like, holy crap, my body is so intuitive. And it was like this whole new world opened up for me and being able to see, see beyond just the like, oh, got to get a tampon or a pad or whatever, you know, you were using. And something that's super interesting, which I wasn't really prepared for. And to be honest, I had not given a lot of thought to, but after having a baby, you know, you have so many hormones in your body and everything is, has a job to do. And then at some point those hormones begin to regulate themselves and you get back to a, a pre-pregnancy state with your hormones. And I had always been under the misconception that as long as you breastfeed or as long as you have that, 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 that heightened hormones in your body, that your menstrual cycle and the bleeding would be postponed. And I was unfortunately not able to breastfeed as long as I wanted to. And, you know, that's just the set of circumstances I had because of my, my birth complications and post-surgical complications that impacted my ability to breastfeed. But my menstrual cycle and bleeding came back sooner than I was expecting. And at first I was devastated. I was like, oh my God, my body, what's happening? It's, it's, I felt almost betrayed and I was already sad because I wasn't able to breastfeed as long as I wanted. And, and then I was doing a little bit more research and and, and coming back to this idea of like, okay, well, what's the information I'm getting from the cycle? And actually what I found was that it's not a bad thing to have your cycle start early at all. It, in fact, and it, and it can happen whether you're breastfeeding or not, in fact, it's actually a sign that your body is, um, is healthy and is regulating itself. And so when you have a prolonged period of a, of a, mi a period of time of a missed menstrual cycle post-birth, that actually can be a bigger concern than your period returning too soon. And mm -hmm. so I, I thought about that and I was like, that makes so much sense that actually your body is kind of, you mentioned this before, like we're always trying to, we naturally get pulled off center and then nature seeks balance. So we get pulled off center in some area of our life and then, 
and then intuitively we somehow are trying to come back to center and our body does the same thing when we are in a general state of health that when we have something big happen actually our body does want to return to the state of homeostasis and and all of a sudden my entire energy shifted and my mentality shifted and I was like thank you body thank you thank you thank you and it was like this immense gratitude that came over me rather than this like devastation and I was like my body is doing exactly what it was meant to be doing and and it is totally healthy and normal and it was just like a reminder of like how powerful our cycle is so beautiful and also a reminder of how powerful societal ideas of what is right for the women's body can be exactly. because our default is to go to that area of oh my goodness like something's not right or oh my goodness like you were talking about earlier people women feeling like their periods are a burden i'm so grateful every month i have my period i literally give thanks when i see blood on my underwear or in the toilet because i am like this is magic my body can still create life my mm -hmm. body can do something absolutely incredible and i really think that honoring that cycle of life and peak and rebirth and death and you know going through this menstrual cycle and the life cycle in our own bodies every month when we are in our bleeding years is incredible and i'm so glad that i came to that lesson while i'm still in these years uh, because definitely when i was younger i you know i called it the rag or the monthly visitor and you know it was <laughs> it was it was not nice. flow yeah yeah, yeah. And now I'm just, I'm so thrilled. I, I work so much with my cycle. I do my acupuncture, my herbs. I, you know, it, it's something I support in any way I can uh, now. Uh, so I love that story though, about how you came back full circle to like this honoring and gratitude. It's, it, it, it has a sweet spot in my heart actually. Mm. Um, yeah. But I think there's also one other kind of layer to getting comfortable with your cycle, talking about your cycle, tracking your cycle is I think there's almost, almost this implicit shame around your sexuality and your feminine body. And I think that's why from a societal standpoint, as young girls and young women, there's often this like party line of like, okay, well, it's, it's a burden and it's something to be ashamed of and it's a hassle and, and it somehow is tied into this like very deep core belief and identity of who we are as women. And I, it's hard for me to almost pinpoint, but I, rem I know what that feeling is from when I was younger, like I was a teenager in my early twenties, um, where it's like, you know, you don't talk about it. You don't want it. Like, you know, you don't tell your boyfriend it's like, oh, I'm on the period. It's, you know, like there's almost this, this weird shame around that. And then all of a sudden when you're able to take power in your body and like you were just saying this like incredible power that our bodies as women have to create life. And like when we, when we reframe the discussion, we reframe our standpoint and our perception of who we are as women. It's like, get out of my way, man. I'm on my period. <laughs> I love that. Like, and this is the thing it is how we have been brought into our cycles too it's like i remember like mom had to go to the store and get me stuff and hide it from dad and put it in the bathroom and have a little talk and i'm like when i have a daughter if i have a daughter and i'm blessed enough i'm gonna have a fucking party <laughs> like on her first period because it is a celebration it is coming into womanhood it is coming into your power into your your total creative force and I think it's just magical. And I think we need to change that as women, as mothers, as um, people who have a platform to how do we change that dialogue for those that are younger now so that it isn't repeated. And there is a lot of shame around it. And there has been, I remember like traveling and I was told if you're bleeding, you can't go into the temple because it's dirty. It's like, what? <laughs> it's dirty? <laughs> like. Yeah, it's a little messy, but it's magical mess. <laughs> yeah, it's well, and 
I mean, I haven't been to, I think it's called Blue Valley Ranch or something. It's an, it's an Ashtanga retreat center in India. And, and I've actually, I've heard they, that this is at the Mysore center to um, Patavi Joyce's center that, mm-hmm. you know, they have a roped off section for the women who are bleeding. And if you are on your period, you are supposed to self segregate into that period, into that section. And then you're given, you know, different asana to do while you're on your cycle. And I had had a student of mine go to this place a few years ago and she came back and she was like, yeah, it was really, you know, awkward. She's like, and I happened to get my period while I was there and I had to go self-segregate into this section in the back roped off. And I was like, come on, you got, I mean, I'm not surprised first of all, but second of all, I'm like, come on, this is (laughs) like so disgusting and despicable. And you know, it's it's, the patriarchy, man. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> you said it, sister. <laughs> no, but this is the thing. I mean, it's different cultures, it's different areas in the world. And yes, it's, you know, different belief systems. But the principle is that the feminine and the power of the feminine is being minimized, segregated, pushed out, pushed away. And, you know, a lot of what I like to not follow, but embrace is the story of the feminine that was pushed away rising. Like if we think about the story of Mary Magdalene mm-hmm. or how, and how her energy is, it is rising right now on this planet and you can see it. And she is all about sacred sexuality, the bleed, you know, the shadow work, the, the dark, but bringing it into the light because of its power. And I just find that so beautiful because this is the energy we need on the planet to help women step into their power, into their sovereignty and into their magic. Really. I so agree. It's, and it is, it's, it's exciting because you can feel like these ripples of energy um, connecting between different women and different groups and different communities of like, you know, people like yourself who are hosting women's circles and hosting ceremonies and encouraging people to track their cycles and teaching people how to do that Mm. it's it's amazing and I love it and and I love more than anything destigmatizing things that have been in the shadow I love shadow work I absolutely love it so much and anything that falls under that blanket umbrella of like it's in the dark it's hidden it's taboo we don't talk about it I'm like let's talk about it (laughs) (laughs) bring it up shine the light on it let's go (laughs) absolutely well I mean that's to me that's the 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 definition of a spiritual practice Mm -hmm. is striving for the integration of light and dark yeah and we all have it Oh, absolutely. We all have it. There's, I, I can't count the number of people I've come across that, you know, say, you yeah, know, I've, I've got it. I've sorted it. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Oh Not my in the God. spiritual community, in the business world. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the spiritual community, everyone are, are, understands there's, there's the shadow that needs the, the, the light shone and the attention too. But definitely in my corporate experience, yeah, there's a lot of, I got it. It's all good. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I think that that just comes back to the safety aspect that if it's something that's unknown, and it's something that requires investigation and and inquiry, then, you know, a lot of people aren't ready, and they don't want to do that work. And and I understand that I do get that. But it's time for people, (laughs) you have to be prepared for a midlife crisis. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, yeah. You know, at our, at our very deepest center, each and every one of us is searching for meaning and we're searching for connection. And mm-hmm. that connection comes from connection to other people, but it also comes from a connection to spirit. And mm-hmm. when we deny our connection to spirit, when we deny that we are in fact all spiritual beings, meaning our essence is spirit, then we're setting ourselves up to have that midlife crisis or to have a perpetuation of a cycle of unhappiness in our life. And I I always find that interesting when people are so unwilling to consider the possibility of something greater than themselves. Yeah, it's a bit heartbreaking, actually, Mm -hmm. because if, if we limit ourselves to this physical body on this physical planet, and there's nothing more meaningful than us going to work, making money and raising a family and dying, then 
why are we really here? You know, mm. who are we really? And I think when we start asking ourselves, what makes me happy? When we start asking that question, then we start to awaken. Because the, what, what makes me happy will start to go down that path of like the home, the car, the partner, the kids, the this, the that. And yes, there will be beautiful experiences throughout, but there's also going to be this like piece that's like, mm, still not feeling fully em like embodied, fully happy. Fully, and you, know, you don't have to be happy all the time, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's still this, this emptiness of something more, something greater, something bigger. What is it? And when, when we get to that point of that, realizing that that question exists, you're in a pretty good place, I think. I agree. Well, and you're able to step out of ego, at least a little bit, to consider the possibility that there's, there's something else out there. And, you know, I love that saying that happiness is an inside job. It's, it's so true. Yeah. Like we can have every car in the world, we can have every fancy vacation in the world, but if we're not finding that contentment, that Santosha coming from within, then we're always going to be searching for something else external to feel, fill us yeah. up. And mm. there's not enough stuff in the world to make any one of us feel whole from the inside out. Totally. And that comes to relationships too. Mm. Not enough relationships or people that can fill it up either. And you see that a lot where people try to fulfill their gap with other people mm -hmm. and I think that's also something that um can can help um mediate the feeling at times but it can also exasperate it when things are hard mm -hmm. oh yeah well <laughs> Kate I feel like we could just talk about these topics forever because it's yeah. it's amazing I mean this is this is what this podcast is all about and um you know, I'm just so happy to have you back on it. And I'm so happy that you're launching this amazing course. And um, for people listening, there's still time to sign up and register. Um, so I'll have all your information, Kate, included on the, um, the show notes on the podcast. Wonderful. So people can go check that out. And um, I'll just look forward to seeing you when you get back to Oslo. Yeah, I can't wait. I want to come visit you up in Hempstead and see this mountain village home. And oh, yes, you're welcome here. anytime. It's, I mean, it's magic and it's so beautiful and it's like, oh, yeah, I, I love wait. it. It's the best ski mountain there, isn't it? In Norway? Yeah, it's it's yeah. supposed to be one of the best. Yeah, Amazing. It's, I mean, I think it's the best. That's why we moved here. But yeah. you know, I can't, I can't. But you and Jonas, you met me in the Alps didn't you? yeah we did we met skiing in the Alps and then we lived together in Park City in Utah and so this is kind of you know this is coming home for us and you know raising our son here and Amazing. it's yeah I mean it's we're so psyched and oh. and it's I'm I'm looking forward to really fully grounding and and then stepping more into my feminine as I grow and expand my business and, and my projects that I have coming up and it's so awesome that I have you in as, as an example so, oh, yeah, I cannot wait to come see what you're creating there, your life. And I'm so, so excited to see what you create next with your businesses. Cause you, Thank you. my sister are an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm in, I'm in the sweet spot, even though sometimes it's, it doesn't feel like it, but, yeah. um, Kate, I want to thank you so much for your time and your energy and, um, yeah, we'll just be in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, Jess. It's been great. Yay. All right. Bye, Kate.